So let's get started. <coughs> Let me just uh, give a little recap of last time. So last time, first we start off by showing lower bounds for, j for JL. Okay, so we mentioned some lower bounds for distributional JL and then we gave the full proof for a lone lower bound for JL itself, preserving a set of vectors. And um, the thing about that JL lower bound is it says there exists a set of vectors where you can't do much better than JL, right? And from there what we did was we moved into kind of beyond worst case analysis. So yes, I can't, there, there, exists, there exist hard sets of vectors that I can't do better than JL on by much. But what about the data right in front of me? Maybe I can do better dimensionality reduction on this particular set of vectors, right? So how can I get kind of instance-wise bounds? <coughs> and kind of we ended with a statement of Gordon's theorem. And before, before we talked about Gordon's theorem, we defined certain things about soups of Gaussian processes, supreme of Gaussian processes. So, um, so let's say T is a bounded subset of Rn. Uh, there's something I defined, the definition is due to Tallegrand, of the gamma 2 functional of T with respect to a distance function D, okay? Um, where, let me actually, I should say something here. So we have that T0 is a subset of T1, so some sort of subset of T, the size of T0 is 1, and the size of TR belongs to the T1. Okay. So <coughs> we define something called the gamma 2 functional, which looks like this. Um, it looks a lot like the Dudley bound that we mentioned, okay, where basically you take this infinite sequence of nets where TR is a 1 over 2 to the R net. And if that soup had been on the inside of the sum, it would have been exactly the Dudley bound. But it turns out that it's uh, even if you pull the soup outside of the sum, you still get a meaningful, uh, expre a meaningful functional, which is highlighted by that theorem. And here, kind of TR, think, you can think of TR as being like a, a high quality net of the set of vectors T, okay? And instead of requiring that it be like an epsilon net, so usually when you talk about nets, you talk about how well it approximates the points, right? And then you try and make the net as small as possible. Here, it's sort of the inverse. I give you a budget on how many points you can put in the net. Namely, TR can have size at most 2 to the 2 to the R. And uh, one first pass attempt at uh, processing this is, given 2 to the 2 to the R points, what's the best quality net I can make of my point set? Okay. If you actually did that, you would get the Dudley bound where the soup is on the inside of the sum. But it, it turns out that even if you pull the soup outside, which is a potentially smaller quantity, this gamma 2 is up to a constant equal to the Gaussian mean width of the set of vectors t. Okay, so g of t is, you take a random Gaussian vector, the entries are normal random variables, mean zero variance one, and you look at this expected soup of g dot x. Okay. And the theorem is that this deterministic quantity is always up to a constant equal to this mean width. Yeah. So yeah, so usually when people talk about an epsilon net with respect to a distance function d, so an epsilon net is of some set of vectors t. And what is an epsilon net of a set of vectors t? It's a subset of those vectors, such well, it's a subset t prime of those vectors, such that every x in t is within epsilon under that distance of some vector in t prime. Everyone in t should be close to someone in t prime. That's the usual net that people like to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. When did we make that transition? Yeah, so. You're talking about last lecture? So last lecture, the take one through take four, the different ways of bounding G of T. Um, <coughs> yeah, so you're right. This. So I'm going to assume from now on that t is finite, okay? But if t, but even if t is infinite, then these things are, you can you can ex very smart. So basically, th the way to think about t being infinite is 
Just imagine taking an epsilon net of t where epsilon is like as small as you'd like, and then apply this to, to that net, okay? Yeah. Right, so that's, yeah, that's true. Although, um, when I start doing proofs, I'm gonna assume that eventually TR is just equal to T because T is finite. Yeah, we're gonna work finite T, but even if this extends to infinite T basically by just, um, yeah, like, arbitrarily. yeah, arbitrarily approximating T by the, a finite net as you want. So if you remember, there was a take two from last lecture where one of the ways we bounded G of T was just taking a net, just taking a single net, epsilon net, and then we got something like root log the size of that net plus epsilon root n, right? So that epsilon root n, can, you can drive to be as small as you want by taking epsilon as small as you want, right? So what you would do is first take such a T prime with a really tiny epsilon, and then you know apply this to T prime. Because T prime is finite. Okay. Um, and then there's, okay, so that's a little recap on Gauss, supremum of Gaussian processes, and then Gordon's theorem. Gordon's theorem is a strengthening of JL, okay? It says that, let me highlight this, I should maybe have written this first. So suppose T is a subset of the unit sphere, so every vector in T has unit norm, okay? Then if you have a matrix with Gaussian entries properly normalized, where the number of rows of your matrix depends on the square of the Gaussian mean width over epsilon squared, then, you know, with good probability, I'm not focusing too much on the failure probability here, with good probability, um, you're not, you're gonna preserve every vector in T simultaneously. The problem that there exists a vector in T that you don't preserve is small. That's Gordon's theorem, okay? And what we saw last lecture was that Gordon's theorem implies JL, because the Gaussian mean width is never bigger than root log the size of the point set. So Gordon's theorem applies JL, and <coughs> uh, there was a very nice recent paper that gives like a converse to that theorem as well. Actually, JL, distributional JL, also implies Gordon's theorem. Okay. Which is not the usual way, Gor I mean, Gordon's theorem was proven in the 80s. Um, that's not how Gordon proved his theorem. And there have been subsequent papers as well that gave alternate proofs of Gordon's theorem with some stronger guarantees on the failure probability. They work not just for Gaussian entries, they work for random signs or other sub-Gaussians. None of those, as far as I'm aware, none of those go through this way of showing the converse, that actually all you really need is distributional JL, and that implies Gordon already. Okay? So I'm, not, I'm going to give you kind of the beginning of the proof of this. There are kind of a bunch of uh, different things you have to bound at some point. Once you see one or two of the things and how to bound them, the others are very similar, so I don't want to do it on the board, but I'll inject it into the notes. And then, um, and then we're going to move on to other jail-related things. So, questions? Yeah. Vectors in Rn with norm one. Yeah, vectors in Rn with norm one, that's right. So like S1 is the circle, and S2 is the s sphere in three dimensions, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Also, just so, to make sure we're, we're on the same page with what DJL means, so recap on a definition, D satisfies you know, epsilon delta DJL if for all X of unit norm, the probability that a random matrix coming from this distribution fails to preserve X up to epsilon is at most delta. Uh, actually, it's gonna be useful for me to say So when we first talked about DJL, I guess last week, we were really only concerned with epsilon being less than one, right? Um, in the proof of, in the ORS proof, um, you're gonna start needing to care a little bit about epsilons that are bigger than one. So you replace max of epsilon epsilon squared, you replace epsilon with the max of epsilon and epsilon squared, 
right? If epsilon is bigger than one, epsilon squared is bigger. Um, just a minor technical detail. Okay, so <coughs> just uh, before I prove this, you know, just think about what this means for, say, a random sign matrix. Okay? For a random sign matrix, we've seen before already that if, if pi ij is a random sign sigma ij over root m, we get epsilon delta djl for m being something like uh, log 1 over delta over epsilon squared, right? Here I'm imagining epsilon is less than 1. If epsilon was bigger than 1, you really only need to divide by epsilon. That followed from the Hansen right proof. Okay. But notice that log 1 over delta over epsilon squared is the same thing as 2 to the r log 1 over delta over 2 to the r over 2 epsilon squared, like for any r. Right? And by our definitions of epsilon r and delta r, this is at least log uh, 1 over delta r over epsilon r squared. Right? So kind of sub-Gaussian, or matrices that have sub-Gaussian entries, like random signs or Gaussians, et cetera, um, they satisfy, this is kind of like a multi-scale this is like a multi-scale uh, DJL, right? We want to satisfy DJL at multiple different scales simultaneously. Because epsilon, epsilon R keeps getting increased as epsilon increases, right? As R increases. So we want to satisfy these different levels of DJL. But some Gaussian maps basically do that for free, right? So what this is telling us is if you take a sub-Gaussian map and it just satisfies it for epsilon tilde and delta, then it'll satisfy it for all the epsilon tilde r's and delta r's as well, just because of that. Right. So question, um, if you have a sub-Gaussian map and you want to satisfy epsilon tilde delta, right, epsilon tilde delta djl, <coughs> you need you need m to be something like um, gamma, so uh, log 1 over delta over epsilon squared, epsilon tilde squared, but by the definition of epsilon, epsilon tilde, that's the same thing as gamma 2 squared of t over epsilon squared. Times log 1 over delta. And then by that theorem, we know gamma 2 and g are basically the same thing. And by the way, whenever I don't, from now on, whenever I don't write the distance function in gamma 2, I mean L2 distance. Okay. We're, pre we're pretty much only going to be doing gamma 2 with respect to L2. Um, so this is, by the theorem, by Fernique and Talagran, this thing is the same thing as g squared over epsilon. Okay, so this provides a proof of Gordon's theorem if you use sub Gaussian maps. Is that, all, is that clear? Other way around. ORS15 ORS15 says this. Okay. Which is the other way, which basically means DJL implies Gordon's theorem. It says if you satisfy DJL at all these different scales, then you preserve everything in T. But in or right, and if you which is JL, which, which um, so DJL, right, so if if D satisfies DJL at all these different scales for, every, for all these different R's, then there's a good probability that you'll preserve everything in T simultaneously. So now the question is, how many rows does a random sign matrix need to have to satisfy DJL at all these different scales? 
But if you satisfy it at the zero scale, you'll satisfy it at all the other scales just by this kind of calculation, right? Just multiply the numerator and denominator both by two to the r. Right? If you, so if you, if you have a, if you just satisfy it at the base scale, you'll satisfy it at all the scales. So how many rows do you need to satisfy it at the base scale r equals zero? You need log one over delta times one over epsilon tilde squared. And log one over delta over epsilon tilde squared is exactly what we want it to be, right? It's gamma two squared, but gamma two and g are the same thing. Right? Yeah. So this, yeah, this is showing that DGL implies. That's right. It, Gordon's theorem is a consequence of that theorem if you take pi to be like a sine matrix or. Um, I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna probably see some, you know, there are other pies that you might consider applying this theorem to. In fact, their paper was about applying this theorem to another pi. In fact, if you look at their paper, nowhere in their paper does this theorem actually appear. <laughs> um, it's just, I just extracted it from their proof. Okay, so. Um, yeah, they were interested in applying something like this to a specific distribution. But if you really unroll their proof, it, that is uh, hidden in their paper or implied by their paper. Okay, so um, let me just, you know, now. <coughs> um, give you a flavor of how to prove that theorem. So first of all, lemma. To achieve. Um, to achieve sup over x and t, pi x L2 norm squared minus one is less than epsilon, suffices that one, um, <coughs> so for all, for all v in tr minus one, or actually I should say for all r, this, what I mean is the set of all difference vectors, okay, a vector in here minus a vector in here, you preserve it. So pi v is at most, we don't care about the lower bound here, we just care about the upper bound, 1 plus 2 to the r over 2, epsilon tilde uh, v, okay, so we want that to be true. Two, we also want that for all v in the same set. This holds, um, this is both the upper bound and lower bound. Uh, let's write, so epsilon tilde r is that thingy. There's a fourth thing we need, which is that the operator number pi <coughs> is, uh, there's a proof, we just need that it's constant.
So the point of this lemma is, is kind of isolating where the randomness in the, in the theorem statement is, OK? So in the statement of ORS, it says the probability that pi preserves everything in T is at least low minus delta. So what we're, the way that it's actually going to go is condition on some event, certain event, namely the events one through four, OK? And if those events all hold, then uh, kind of with certainty, we'll have that everything in T is preserved. So really, it just reduces to showing that all these events hold simultaneously and showing that these events suffice to say that you preserve everything in T. Okay. Um, so I don't want to spend much time on these things here. So for, we're going to see a little bit of that later when we talk about subspace embeddings in this course. Um, if you want to say a random matrix has bounded operator norm, that's saying that pi x, the norm of pi x is at most something times the norm of x for all x. And you can do that by a union bound over a net. So you can do that by, d by DJL over a net, okay, a net of, the, of, of, all, of all of Rn. Um, we'll see more of that later, so I don't want to dwell on that. One through three are basically JL, right? So let's ignore three for a second. One and two are pretty much JL, right? So one says that for all vectors in a certain set, pi should not blow up their norm by a certain amount. That's exactly a JL kind of statement, right? So how many, you know, to make that happen with good probability, you can apply DJL to that set of vectors, TR minus one union TR union TR minus TR minus one. Okay. How big is that set of vectors? Oh, by the way, what is this, what are these TRs? In this proof, the TRs are the sequence that achieve that int. Right, so the definition of gamma two says, choose the TRs of size at most two to the two of the R, which minimizes that soup. In the proof of ORS, these TRs are chosen to be the TRs that achieve, that achieve the int. They're the best TRs. We don't need to know what they are. Just the fact that they exist is enough for the proof. Okay, so as long as we, as long as we don't blow up any norms of the vectors v in, in that set, um, we're good. How big is that set? Well, tr minus one has size at most two to the two to the r. Tr has size at most two to the two to the r. The difference vectors has size at most two to the two to the r squared, which is at most four to the two to the r. Right. So that's we can apply JL to that set of vectors, the standard JL that you know. Same thing at the, the second line, right? The second line is what we showed with Hansen Wright. Here I needed, <coughs> here epsilon tilde r can sometimes be bigger than one, right? Depending on what r is in relation to epsilon. So that's why we need the version where you have to handle also things that are, you know, epsilons that are bigger than one. But this too is also standard from things you've seen. How about three? So three is something about dot products, okay? So we haven't talked explicitly in this class about preserving dot products with JL. We've only talked about preserving norms of vectors. But notice, notice the following. U plus V, oh and by the way, when I say TR minus U, I got confused the first time I read the paper. So TR minus U is not set difference. It's not the set TR minus U. It's every vector in this set minus every vector in that set. Well, that set only has the vector u. So it's all vectors of the form v minus u, where v is something in tr. So notice that u plus v squared, just by expanding, this is u plus v dot u plus v. If you expand u plus v dot u plus v, this is u squared plus v squared minus uh, plus 2u dot v. And also notice that u minus v squared is equal to u squared plus v squared minus 2u dot v, right? Which implies that u plus v squared minus uh, u minus v squared times a quarter is equal to u dot v. And 
now um, pretend u and v are both unit norm vectors, right? Then this is equal to 2 plus 2 u dot v. This is equal to 2 minus 2 u dot v. Now, what if pi preserved u plus v and it also preserved u minus v, right? We would have that pi u plus pi v L2 norm squared is equal to 1 plus or minus epsilon plus 1 plus or minus epsilon plus 2 pi u dot pi v. And we would also have that pi u minus pi v squared is 1 plus or minus epsilon plus 1 plus or minus epsilon minus 2 pi u dot v, pi v, right? Which implies that a quarter pi u plus v squared minus pi u minus v squared is equal to um, u dot v plus or minus uh, kind of epsilon, well, plus or minus epsilon, or plus or minus O of epsilon. Right. This right here, this right here is pi u dot pi v. So if you're using JL to preserve vectors of the form u plus v as well as vectors of the form u minus v, it implies that you also preserve dot products up to additive epsilon. And then I assumed here that u and v had unit norm. Well, if they don't have unit norm, scale both sides by the norm of u and the norm of v. And then you'll get here, you'll get here the norm of u, the norm of v. Right? Which is exactly the statement. Okay? So statement three also follows by JL. You just need to apply JL to the set of all vectors that are sums of, so here you have u and tr minus one, you have v and tr, right? What you want to do is you want to preserve all differences and, and sums of such vectors as well. Which is again something you can do with JL. So <coughs> I'm not going to do all the calculations for this. I just want to point out satisfying this lemma is something you know how to analyze using JL. It's like one, one and two are vanilla JL, and three is JL on these because of this kind of calculation. So I, so I actually, actually, so I do mean, I, so, okay, what I, I do mean JL on um, basically, I want a pi. So what I want is a deterministic condition to hold. There's no randomness here. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we're so actually, yeah, we're we're going through DJL. But what what we actually need is we just need this lemma to happen. We just need one through four to happen, right? And the way that we're going to get one through four to happen is by using DJL repeatedly at different scales. For each r, we, there's a different epsilon tilde r we care about. We're going to apply DJL. We're going to union bound over all the r's and all the points and say all of this happens with good probability. Um, but you know, actually, we only need a pi that just satisfies one through four. Yeah. Okay. Does, is that clear? So, you know, let's say um, now. Let's say, like, the, let's show that the lemma implies the theorem. So let's just pretend that everything here holds, okay? All the conditions one through four hold. <coughs> Define, so L, capital L was log N, right? Uh, capital L was log N. I'm going to define L tilde which is uh, 
basically log of 1 over epsilon tilde squared. Okay. Which, by the way, the interesting case is when this is less than L. Right? Because at, at the end of the day, uh, uh, at the end of the day, I'm, I want to do dimensionality reduction. I know that my final bound on the number of rows is going to be at least 1 over epsilon tilde squared, right? So there's no point in me doing any, there's no point in me doing this at all if 1 over epsilon tilde squared is bigger than n. n is the dim original dimension. I'm trying to do dimensionality reduction. So 1 over epsilon tilde squared is less than n. So log of it is less than log n. So this number is somewhere between, is between 0 and capital L. We care about DJL scales up to capital L. This thing is less than capital L. And then what we're going to do is fix, <coughs> fix, um, fix uh, some x and t. We'll show pi x L square m squared minus x squared. Less than epsilon. Condition on all the events of the lemma occurring. Okay. And notationally, it's going to be useful for me to define um, See a little frustration or no questions? No questions. Okay. <coughs> this is me just setting up some not you know variables. I haven't done anything yet. Okay. Now let's actually do something. What I want to say is that pi preserves x. Notice that uh, pi x L to norm squared minus x squared. Okay. <coughs> I'm just going to do a bunch of triangle inequalities. Um, oh, and also, let me also define. <coughs> okay. So, ZR for me is the closest point in TR to X. I fixed a particular X. ZR is the closest point in TR. I want to do a bunch of triangle inequalities. I'm going to say that this thing is at most, um, <coughs> say, pi X L2 norm squared minus Z, uh, <coughs> ZL tilde L2 norm squared. So that's my first triangle inequality. I subtracted z tilde l, and then I'm going to add it back. Um, plus x l2 norm squared minus z l tilde l2 norm squared. <coughs> um, let me just do a little bit pi here. So triangle inequality, I subtracted z tilde l and added it back. And I also subtracted pi z l tilde and added it back. And then I did triangle inequality. Okay. Now, <coughs> we can already eliminate some of this. So we know that, um, well, we know by item 2 that pi preserves z l tilde squared. <coughs> Um, actually, let me let me do another step before I get there. Um, I want to say that this is at most.
bit of a mouthful. But let's just go over this. And let me also define, let me give these some names. Let me call this alpha. Let me call this beta. Let me call this uh, <coughs> gamma. And let me call this whole thing delta. Right, so what we showed is that this thing we care about is at most the sum of four errors, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And the goal is to show that like kind of all of these are false. Okay. So what did I do here? First step I already said, I did a triangular inequality by adding things in and subtracting them. And then what did I do next? Well, <coughs> some of the things I just carried over. X squared minus DL tilde squared is here. Okay. Um, pi X squared minus pi ZL tilde squared is here. And then what I did was I, um, I took this term and I wrote it as a telescoping sum, right? Notice if you look at this sum, I'm taking something and subtracting something else. And in the very next sum and, I'm adding that thing that I subtracted and then um, basically this thing just telescopes. And what I'm left with is the last term minus the zeroth term. But then I added back in the zeroth term. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bound two of them. One of them is super easy. And then the other two I'm just going to insert into the notes because they're, two sim they're similar enough that I think there's not much value in me spending time on the board here. So the first term, which of these terms to you looks the easiest to bound? There's one term here that's like immediate. It's essentially, you know. So between alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, which thing is immediate? One of them is immediate. Yeah, alpha is immediate, right? It follows from item two in the lemma. We preserve all. We preserve everything um, up to error epsilon tilde r. So it means we preserve z zero up to epsilon tilde zero. But by definition, epsilon tilde zero is the same thing as epsilon tilde, right? So for alpha, what we have is pi 0 L2 norm squared minus Z0 L2 norm squared is at most uh, epsilon tilde 0, but that's just epsilon tilde. Okay. So that's immediate. <coughs> I think that the other one that I'm going to do is, let me do gamma. Okay. Gamma is the next one that is, you know, it's like the second shortest, but has all the ideas that you need for delta and beta. So I might as well do that one. OK, so <coughs> now notice that uh, what, is what is gamma? It's that thingy. So first, what I'm going to say is um, that's a difference of two squares, right? So what I have is that x squared minus zl tilde squared. This is a squared minus b squared, so I can write it as a minus b, a plus b. This is equal to um, x minus z l tilde times uh, x plus z l tilde. And then I'm going to do something funny. Here I'm going to subtract 2z L tilde and then add it back. Okay. So this thing here is at most <coughs> x minus z L tilde. I subtracted two times this, and then I'm at, and then I add it back and do triangle inequality plus two times z L tilde. So this whole thing is at most <coughs> x minus z L tilde squared plus x minus z L tilde times 
times 2 z l tilde. Right? But tr is a subset of t. Right? So z l tilde is an element of t. So it has unit norm. So this thing here is at most 2. So I, I bounded gamma by this squared, something squared plus something times 2. So really, it just boils down to bounding this thing. Right. <coughs> so let's do that. It's going to be quite short. Yeah, this whole proof is essentially a bunch of triangle inequalities over and over and over. So let's bound that thing that I circled. We have that x minus z l tilde <coughs> is at most some r equals uh, l tilde to l of z r plus 1 minus z r. OK, so convention for this proof, just define zr plus 1 to equal x, OK? <coughs> so nowhere in, this, nowhere in the lemma do I need to preserve tl plus 1, uh, tl plus 1. If you look at the things I need to preserve in this proof, I never need to preserve anything beyond level l. It's, I preserve everything for r between 0 and l. So let me just, for convenience of notation, define zl plus 1 to be x itself, OK? And now, <coughs> right, this is just a triangle inequality because I can write I can write this thing inside as a sum over those r's from l tilde to l of z r plus one minus z r. That's equal to this, and then I use triangle inequality, <coughs> and then again use triangle inequality. This is at most the sum over those r's l tilde to l of zr plus 1 minus, uh, minus x plus zr minus x. And now remember my definition. <coughs> this thing is at most uh, the sum over r, 2 times the sum over r from l tilde to l of er. And now, I'm in the regime now where r is bigger than l tilde, right? And what is l tilde? l tilde is log 1 over epsilon squared, right? So 2 to the l tilde, 2 to the l tilde is, some, is something like 1 over epsilon tilde squared. 2 to the l tilde over 2 is something like 1 over epsilon, or 1 over epsilon tilde. So this is at most. <coughs> some constant, I'm not going to care about constants, some r from l tilde to l of 2 to the r over 2 times epsilon tilde times er. Right, I just artificially inserted this because I'm in the regime for r where this is bigger than, one, bigger than or equal to 1. But this is, I can pull this epsilon tilde out, this is at most epsilon tilde times some r goes from l tilde to l, 2 to the r over 2 times er. But this is, by definition, uh, this thing here is at most gamma 2, right? Gamma 2 was the sup over all x of r from 0 to infinity of this sum. So this thing is less than gamma 2. So this thing is at most epsilon tilde gamma 2. Okay, which is why in the statement of ORS, I set epsilon tilde to be something like epsilon over gamma 2. 
because then the gamma 2s cancel and I get epsilon. So again, um, <coughs> again, gamma is bounded by epsilon. Okay. And the, pr the, you know, the bounds of, for beta and delta are very similar. It's, it's a bunch of triangle inequalities, relating things to ER, and then saying, oh, the thing I have is less than gamma 2. So you can check the notes. I'll put, I'll insert the details there. But does the structure of this proof make sense to you? You have a question? Uh, yeah. Oh, x minus g l tilde. Oh, I see. Um, this is definitely what they do in their paper. You're saying, why don't I just bound this by e l tilde? <laughs> yeah, what you're actually what you're saying sounds very correct to me. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, maybe you know it's a, it's a this paper just basically just came out on the archives, so you know. Actually, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. You're saying, why am I bothering with this telescoping? I can just bound this by EL tilde. Yeah. And then say that EL tilde is at most 2 to the L tilde over 2. Yeah. And then I'm done. I think, actually, you're right. That sounds very, that sounds very reasonable to me. Um, I think this kind of telescoping does probably become necessary when you bound the other terms. Oh, okay. they, they used it to bound this term, too, in their paper. But I think you just. Uh, Simplified a section of their paper, so, <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> yeah, very good point. Anyway, so that's that's all I want to say from that paper. I don't want to get bogged down by a bunch of triangle inequalities um, at this point. So we still have we still have about half an hour left. I want to spend a little time on just one more JL thing. Um, before we start it moving into things beyond just JL itself, okay? And it's going to be the following thing. Yeah. Uh, so, qu any questions about this proof? No, it's very good. I guess they they, pro they might have just missed it. So <laughs> it seems yeah. <coughs> um. Okay. So. The remain, remaining part of the lecture, what I want to talk about is, so what have we talked about? We've talked about JL and Gordon's theorem beyond worst case analysis. Um, <coughs> there's another aspect of JL which people often care about, which is, you know, first of all, let's go back to dimensionality reduction itself. You know, how did I motivate it in the first lecture on dimensionality reduction? I said we have some high dimensional problem, like nearest neighbor search or whatever other thing we're doing. We want to reduce it to low dimension and then solve the lower dimensional problem and hope that gives us a good solution to the original problem, right? And <coughs> so there's like two steps here. One is doing the actual dimensionality reduction and two is solving the lower dimensional problem. Now, if, if we map it to really low dimension, we've sped up part B quite a lot, right? The lower the, presumably the lower the dimension, the better, right? The, the better storage, the faster we can go, et cetera. But there's also step one, which is actually doing the dimensionality reduction, right? So, so one, do the reduction. Two, solve lower dimensional problem. And kind of up to up until now, in the last couple of lectures, we've been focusing we've been focusing our attention on this, right? You know, trying to get trying to get the the m, the target dimension, to be as small as possible, even going beyond worst case to get it even smaller than the lower bound in certain cases. Doing the reduction, though, I mean, what are we doing? We're multiplying by a random sign matrix or something like that. Right? So far, this 
so far, this thing has been dense matrix vector multiplication. Right? Which <coughs> you can do some for loops, right? But you could ask, can I do step one faster? Right? Can I maintain the same quality of dimension reduction as JL as we've talked about so far? or maybe wor worsen it slightly. But for item one, I want that to go as fast as it's possible. So remaining part of lecture, is going to be do one faster. So <coughs> I think there are two natural ways to go about trying to do one faster. One is make pi fast, make pi sparser. Right? If pi is sparse, you can multiply by it faster. We saw that, I think, on PSET 1, maybe problem 3 or 4. In, in class, we did the AMS sketch for L2 norm estimation in data streams, where it was a random sign matrix with four wise independent entries. And there was a homework assignment where, instead of using that pi, you combined it with some hashing, where every column of pi has exactly one non-zero entry, which is a plus minus one. Right? So that was a way of making pi sparser, but still giving you the same guarantees in the streaming model for L2 norm estimation. We're going to do something like that here. So make pi sparse. The other, the other is um, make pi structure. Okay. So it's not just a dense random matrix. It is some random matrix, but it's going to have a certain structure that allows us to multiply by it faster. So we're going to cover both of these. Some of this might spill over into Tuesday before we got, move into other stuff. So I'm going to start off with the first bullet. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of history of this, <coughs> um, there was a paper of Ochlioptas. I believe it was in pods. Oh, one maybe? I might be off on the year. Basically, it looks something like pi ij is equal to um, plus one, well, plus one with probability <coughs> uh, a sixth, minus one with probability a sixth, and zero with probability two thirds. And there's some scale factor. We need to put some scale factor here just to make sure the norms have, the columns have unit norm. So I think it's actually this times, uh, you have to divide by root m over 3 or something like that. Okay. And what he showed is if you use this distribution, you still have independent entries. If you use this distribution, then you'll get DJL, okay, distributional JL. And you'll get it even with kind of the same. So, so far, we've just been using big O's everywhere. M can be big O, 1 over epsilon squared, log 1 over delta. Some of these papers, like Akhliopta's paper, actually is pretty precise in, in its analysis and even gives you a constant factor. And the constant factor he got using this distribution was the same constant factor other people were getting for using a fully dense matrix. So essentially what he's saying is, 
you can keep the same exact number of rows, even the constant factor can be the same, but you can make it three times sparser. Because in expectation, only two thirds of the entries of this matrix are non zero. Are only one third of the, of the entries of this matrix are non zero. Right? So it's like a factor three speed up to multiply pi times x. OK. Um, and Matushik gave some evidence that you can't really hope to do much better than this. So there's a paper by Matushik in 08 which said that if pi has independent entries, then you can't really specify by more than a constant factor. Okay. So I think at first people looked at that and said, oh, okay, so I'll just go solve it. There's nothing to do here. But then you have to realize there's a condition. If pi has independent entries, then you can't do better. So what do you do? You break the condition. You come up with a pi that doesn't have independent entries. So the first people to do that were um, very nice paper, uh, Dasgupta, Gupa, uh, das, wait, uh, uh, Kumar, yeah, okay, that's it. Dasgupta, Kumar, and Sharlosh, this is in stock 2010. Um, you know, they got something like M can be. O tilde, I'll say what that means, is 1 over epsilon log cubed 1 over, ah. M can be 1 over epsilon squared log 1 over delta. And then you have S being O tilde 1 over epsilon log cubed 1 over delta, non-zeros per column of pi. Okay. So, they get the same M that we're used to for DJL using a dense random matrix. Okay. But the number of non zeros per column of pi looks like this O tilde hides log 1 over epsilon, for example. And maybe also a log log 1 over delta, I don't remember. But definitely log 1 over epsilons. Now, if delta is not too small, you know, we improved epsilon from epsilon squared to epsilon, but we worsened delta. So depending on the parameters, you know, this could be better than M, which is saying that kind of a non-trivial number, like a lot of entries in the column, not just two thirds, but a lot of the entries in the column are zero. Okay. And then what I'm going to talk about today, there were some better analyses of this construction. I'm not going to write down the construction. There were some better analyses later that showed you could get a two here instead of a three, but there's still some tension because log is getting log one over delta is getting worse, one over epsilon is getting better. What I'm going to show you today is uh, due to you, Daniel and myself, where we showed that you can take M to be one over epsilon squared log one over delta and S to be one over epsilon log one over delta. Okay, so you can always have an epsilon fraction of every column be non zero. So kind of most of, every, most of every column is non-zero. There's no tension now. The dependence on delta stays the same. There's no trade-off. It just gets, it's just strictly better. Okay. And the matrix is very simple. One thing you can do is every column, you pick exactly S locations, and in each location you put a random sign over root S, and then the rest is zero. So this is an M by N matrix. This does not have, in, this does not have independent entries. Every column has exactly s non zeros, not expected s non zeros. Exactly, it had exactly. That's right. It had exactly one non zero per column, not expected one. That's right. Or you could also choose pi to be something like this matrix, where. So kind of divide, divide up the rows into blocks. There's the first M over S rows, the next M over S rows, et cetera. In each block, for each column, in each block, you'll have exactly one non-zero entry, which is a random sign. 
scaled appropriately, and the rest is zero. I claim you've seen this matrix before, by the way. So is there anywhere you've seen this matrix that you can think of? Pretend that they weren't signs. Pretend they were just the number one. Pretend I just put ones there. Where have you seen this matrix? Huh? Yeah, so, okay, so you're saying the way that I got incoherent matrices from codes looked a lot like this. Okay, so what if I, so there, it was kind of, it was deterministic, right? Once I had the code, I would just put a, I just put a one corresponding to a code word. But this exact construction where in each place I put like a random, a one in a random location, that's exactly the Countman sketch, right? So if you write the Countman sketch, before when I drew the Countman sketch, I drew it as, you had this grid of counters. This would be actually S, and this would be something like M over S. And in each place, for each, for each coordinate, you hashed it to one place in each row, and then you, you added it there. So writing it this way, I'm writing the counters that you store. But if you think of what the algorithm is doing to get these counters, it's a, it's a linear sketch. The algorithm is maintaining some matrix times the vector x. And what is the matrix that it's maintaining? It's exactly this matrix where uh, kind of for each of the s rows, you're telling me where he hashed to there. Okay. So count min sketch, you just add him there. So you just have a one here. In count sketch, Right? In count sketch, you actually put a sign there because you, in count sketch, you don't want point query with L1 error, you want point query with L2 error. Right? So this, this matrix is exactly the count sketch due to uh, Char Charlie Karchen and Ferret Fulton. So you can use either of these two matrices. I'll show you the analysis. So <laughs> in our original paper, well, in that paper, um, we started off with one analysis based on the hansen wright inequality, and it wasn't getting us exactly what we wanted. It was off by a square root log. So then we did a more, unfortunately, more calculation-heavy analysis, which got the right answer. Um, but kind of more recently, over the summer, I was, I was on a long plane ride uh, to a conference, and then the guy next to me was also going to that conference and asked me how it worked. And I, as I was... Uh, writing it down, I realized that there, there's actually a, a simpler proof than what's in the paper to get the right bound. So I'll just show you that proof. Okay. So yeah, that's thing. So I, that was Mikkel Thorup sitting next to me. So thanks to him for asking me to show the proof of this. <laughs> um, okay, so analysis. I'm pretty sure, so we have about 15 minutes. I'm pretty sure this analysis can fit 15 minutes. Uh, let's see. Um, we might have to, we're going to see this, though, probably on Tuesday, the structure of the matrix. So. Um, analysis. So before, by the way, before I do the analysis, note pi x can be, you know, this is the, this is the bottom line, can be computed in time s times the support size of x, right? Just by naively using for loops. So that's why you want s to be as small as possible. And notice that kind of the runtime depends on the sparsity of x, and there are some applications where x actually is sparse, and we care about this. What the structured one is going to do for us is it's going to let us be faster on dense matrices, uh, on dense vectors x. Okay. Um, so there's an open problem there, which is kind of get something which is the better of both for all, for all vectors, whether they're sparse or dense. But I'll, I'll state that on Tuesday. So analysis, we're going to use the hansen wright inequality. Okay. So remember before, when we did hansen wright we said that pi x was actually the same thing as ax sigma. Remember back when we, when we did with dense sand matrices, where ax looked something like this, x transpose, x transpose, X transpose. Does that look familiar? So when we analyzed DJL last week for the random sign matrix, we just said that this thing is equal to that. 
which implies that pi x L2 norm squared minus 1 is equal to uh, sigma transpose AX transpose AX sigma minus the expectation of sigma transpose AX transpose AX sigma. Right? And this is exactly the setup of Hansen Wright. We have a quadratic form here. So <coughs> we're going to do something very similar for sparse jail. We're going to use this kind of proof. So what does, what does pi x look like? What does pi x look like when, um, when we're using this matrix? So let me introduce some notation. So for sparse jail, Let's say that pi um, ij is actually sigma ij delta ij over root s, where delta ij is in 0, 1, and sigma ij is a random sign. So delta is just telling me whether or not that entry is non-zero. So delta is random. The deltas are not independent, right? Because you know that there are exactly s non-zeros per column, for example. They're not independent. So I claim now pi x is actually equal, so for SJL, pi x is equal to, again, AX sigma. But now AX looks something like this. There's actually a 1 over root f here, 1 over root m for dense JL. For us, there's a 1 over root s <coughs> times uh, this matrix, x1 transpose, x2 transpose, xm transpose. Okay. What is this x, what is this thingy? xr i is equal to delta r i x i. So you can verify this, but it follows from some computation. So xr is the vector x, except you zero out certain entries according to delta. So you look at the, you look at the rth row, you look at the rth row of pi, some of these entries in the rth row are non-zero and some are zero. And the ones that are non-zero, you keep x around. You keep that entry of x around. And the ones that are zero, you throw away. So is, are we clear on what this means? You don't have a question. Do you have a question? Yeah, so, <coughs> so I'm not going to justify it on the board. It follows from some simple computation. But I claim that pi, the, the matrix pi, like either of these pi's times the vector x, can still be written as a sub x times sigma, where now a sub x is this matrix. So instead of x transpose, x transpose, x transpose, we have like x1 transpose, x2 transpose, xm transpose, where <coughs> xr is a vector, right? So xr, xr looks like delta r1, x1, delta r2, x2, delta r3, x3, et cetera. So we just, we only keep entries in x that correspond to things that are actually non-zero in row r of pi. <coughs> yeah. Sigma is like, think of sigma as being, yeah. So sigma is like mn dimensional. Yeah, that's right. Some won't matter because they're zeroed out. Um, so now we can again write the same thing here. Right? <coughs> Notice that whenever you have sigma transpose and matrix sigma, the diagonals are always, you have a bunch of like sigma i squareds. Right? But a random sign squared is one. So what is the expectation of this? The expectation of this is exactly the trace of this matrix, right? 
because the off diagonals have expectation zero, you have different signs, and the diagonals give you one. So the expectation is the trace of this matrix. And then here, the trace survives without any error and cancels the expectation out exactly. And really, the only thing that matters are the off diagonals. Okay. And actually, that's, that's, that's actually the reason why in, uh, dependent entries matter so much. The fact that, yeah, so the point is the diagonal entries here always cancel out the entries here. So if actually, if I were to write it out, another way of writing it is you can write pi x L2 norm squared as being <coughs> um, some r goes from 1 to m. There's a 1 over s here. Some i goes from 1 to n delta r i x i squared. Right? And this is equal to 1 over s some r goes from 1 to m uh, sum over i from 1 to n delta r i x i squared plus the off diagonals. Right? Plus the case where i is not equal to j. But if you just reverse the order of summation here, this part here is equal to 1 over s times the sum of x i squared times the sum over r of delta r i. What's this? It's S, right? It's how many non-zeros are in the ith column. It's S. S cancels that S, and you're left with the L2 norm squared. Right? So pi x L2 norm squared is exactly what you want it to be, plus some off-diagonal error term. And really what you have to show is that this term is small. What happens if you don't have exactly S per column, but you have expected S per column? This term doesn't disappear exactly. And that's actually what screws you over. That's why if you go with this kind of octonopsis kind of approach, you're not going to get asymptotic improvement. It's really the diagonals that screw you. Um, good. <coughs> so <coughs> so good. So we have this, right? We have that. We have this thingy. So pi x L2 norm squared minus 1 is equal to ax sigma L2 norm squared minus the expectation. Right, so this thing here is sigma transpose ax transpose ax sigma. Right, so that thing looks like ax transpose ax looks like 1 over s times this big block diagonal matrix that has x1, x1 transpose up to xm, xm transpose. Okay. But what I actually care about is this thing minus the expectation. So the diagonals are all zeroed out, right? Because the, tr the, tr the trace exactly gets canceled, right? The diagonals exactly get canceled. So actually, let me write this thing. So let me write this thing as pi x L2 norm squared minus 1 is exactly equal to sigma transpose bx sigma, where bx is this matrix, but with the diagonals canceled out. OK, does that make sense? bx is ax transpose ax with zero diagonals. And remember, Hanson Wright says that for all p bigger than or equal to 1, um, if you look at the p norm of sigma transpose b x sigma, it's at most, uh, it's at most p times the operator norm plus root p times the Frobenius norm. Right? But actually, b is a random matrix that depends on delta. 
right? So there's actually a p norm again here over the randomness in delta. So remember what p norm means. It means I'm taking the expectation to the p of power. So first take the expectation over sigma. That then you can apply Hansen right. But now you're left with, you know, the p norm for Hansen right depends on these operator and Frobenius norms, but those are random. So now take the p norm over delta. So let's bound the p, let's let's bound this thing, and then ultimately what we'll say is ultimately what we'll say is that the probability that sigma transpose b x sigma is bigger than epsilon is at most um, one over epsilon to the p times the p norm to the p. This is Markov, right? So it, it all boils down to bounding the p norm of, of this thing. This is Markov's infinity. Right. This thing is the same thing as the problem that this to the p is bigger than this to the p, and then now I did Markov. So let's look at the operator norm. The operator norm of bx, <coughs> right? Well, is the max over r between 1 and m of the operator norm of bxr, where, <coughs> right, this is. I'm calling this, this here is like A1, you know, well, this is like BX1, and this is like BXM. It's the different blocks. Whenever you have a block diagonal matrix, the eigenvalues are the eigenvalues of each block. And this matrix here is A, is, uh, you know, X1 over S times XR, XR transpose, <coughs> minus the diagonals. X, uh, XR1 squared, XRM squared. Right? right that's I took that matrix, XX transpose, or XRXF transpose, and I zeroed out the diagonal. Zeroing out the diagonal means subtracting off this. And I'm going to take the operator norm of this. So whenever you have, I mean, one thing you do is just triangle inequality. The operator norm of the difference is at most the operator norm of this plus the operator norm of this. If you take the difference of two PSD matrices, then actually the operator norm is just, so this is at most. 1 over s times the max of the operator norm of xr, xr transpose, and the max, and, and this thingy, this diagonal matrix. Right? The operator norm of this is exactly the L2 norm squared of this matrix, which is at most the L2 norm squared of x. It's x with some stuff zeroed out. So this thing is at most 1. What's the, L2, what's the operator of this? Well, it's a diagonal matrix. It's at most the largest diagonal entry, which is also at most 1, right? So this is also at most 1. So actually, independently of the randomness in delta, this thingy is always at most 1 over s. Okay? This is always true. So this thing we've taken care of. The only thing left is to bound the Frobenius norm. And we're going to show we're going to show on um, Tuesday morning that if you set p to be log one over delta, like we're going to, you can actually bound and you set m and s to be what I said you set them to be. You, know, you can actually bound this p norm by something like roughly one over root m or a constant over root m. So you're going to get p over s plus root p over root m, and then when you plug that into this Markov inequality, you get you get bjf. So Tuesday, we'll bound this thing. Okay? So, questions?